All right, so now we have a theory for um, second order partial derivatives of a scalar field. The first order partial derivative uh, of a scalar field is a one by n matrix, and the second order partial derivative is an n by n real symmetric matrix. So um, what can we use this information for? Well, we can use this to construct a second degree Taylor polynomial of a scalar field. This would be t sub two of x equals f of the original point p, plus the Jacobian derivative of f evaluated at the original point times the change vector delta p plus 1 over 2 factorial and this last term here what is it it's the inner product of the change vector with the hessian derivative evaluated at p times the change vector well this last term should look somewhat familiar this inner product is a vector inner product with a real symmetric matrix times the change vector that's the quadratic form so this first part here is a linear approximation, and the second part here is 1 over 2 factorial times the quadratic form associated to the Hessian derivative. So the idea is that we use the um, second order, uh, uh, d a second degree Taylor polynomial to approximate values of the scalar field when the length of the change vector is small. So here's an example of using the second degree Taylor uh, polynomial. Here I have a scalar field on two variables. I have uh, calculated the Jacobian derivative, that's a one by two matrix here, and I've calculated the Hessian derivative, that's a two by two real symmetric matrix. Now, let's say that I'm focused on the point negative three, one, and I want to use data at the point negative three, one to approximate uh, F of, or sorry, let, let's say that I'm focused on the point negative four, two, and I want to use data at negative four, two to approximate F of negative three, one. Well, my approximation of f of negative 3, 1 can be given by my second order, uh, second degree Taylor polynomial. This will be my original output, that's f of negative 4, 2, which happens to be negative 15 here. So this is what I would get if I replaced x equals negative 4 and y equals 2 in my original expression for f. Now my next term is the Jacobian derivative evaluated at x equals negative 4 and y equals 2. So I'm going to my formula for the Jacobian derivative and replace an x with negative 4 and y with 2. So that gives me 4, negative 16. Then I multiply by my change vector here. Well, if I'm moving from negative 4, 2 to negative 3, 1, my change vector is 1, negative 1. Now I have my next term, which is 1 over 2 factorial times the quadratic form evaluated at the change vector. So this would be uh, the change vector transpose, 1, negative 1 as a row, multiplied by the Hessian derivative evaluated at negative 4, 2. This is what I would get if I plugged in x equals negative 4 and y equals 2 into my Hessian derivative. That gives me this specific 2 by 2 matrix. And then I multiply by the change vector as a column, 1, negative 1. When I do all of my arithmetic here, I end up with the output negative 7 halves. So this is my approximation of the output of this function at negative 3, 1 using data at the original point, negative 4, 2. Now um, let's think about how we can make an analogy to calc 1. Remember in calc 1 we use the, second, the sign of the second derivative to figure out the concavity of our function. Well in this situation the second derivative is an n by n matrix, that's the Hessian. Well what is the sign of the Hessian? Well, the Hessian is a real symmetric matrix, which defines a quadratic form, which has definiteness. So the idea is that we use the definiteness of the Hessian to define the concavity of our function. So a picture, and abstractly we can think of the pictures as looking like this. What does concave up mean if I have several variables as an input? Well, it might look like, uh, the graph might look like some sort of bowl in high dimensions. But the idea is that um, this would occur if my Hessian derivative is positive definite. And what's the utility of knowing that I'm concave up? It means that any linear approximation could be expected to be an underestimate. Concave down would be the opposite situation. So maybe my multidimensional picture would look like a bowl opening downward. Um, this would be the situation where my Hessian derivative was negative definite, in which case my linear approximation could reasonably be expected to be an overestimate. And um, a third situation would sort of be a multi-dimensional inflection point, and a, a typical picture of that looks like what's called a saddle. 
And this would occur if my Hessian derivative were an indefinite uh, uh, real symmetric matrix, which really means that if I were trying to look for whether or not my linear approximation was an over or underestimate, the direction that I'm traveling in would actually matter. So that actually covers three of the five situations for definiteness. Um, in general, further analysis would be required if our uh, Hessian was semi-definite but not definite. So the, 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 the punchline here is that Hessian derivative being positive definite tells us that linear approximations are expected to be underestimates. Hessian derivative that's negative definite tells us linear approximations uh, can be expected to be overestimates. And if the Hessian is indefinite, then the direction we're traveling in matters if we want to know whether or not our linear approximations are over or underestimates. Now, um, let's look at an example where we apply this concept. So here's a scalar field on two variables. Um, if I use the point negative 4, 2 to linearly approximate f of negative 15 over 4, comma 9 fifths, um, my approximation with the linear approximation would be f of the original point, so that's f uh, evaluated at x equals negative 4 and y equals 2, where the original output is equal to 6. Then I calculate the Jacobian derivative at my original point, which turns out to be 4, 6, negative 16, and I multiply by the change vector, which in this case is 1 fourth negative 1 fifths. When I conduct the linear approximation, this ends up giving me negative 54 over 5. So the question is, I've used the um, uh, linear approximation to tell me approximately what the output of my function is at this new input, but should I expect this approximation to be an over or underestimate? Well, I could then look at the Hessian derivative so I've calculated the Hessian derivative and plugged in x equals negative 4 and y equals 2 and produced this 2 by 2 real symmetric matrix. And to know whether or not my linear approximation was an over or underestimate, I need to know the definiteness of this 2 by 2 real symmetric matrix. Now, when we first learned about definiteness, we said, well, we need to know the eigenvalues to truly know the definiteness. But then we learned about LDL transpose factorizations, which said, well, I can just row reduce this thing, and as long as I don't need a row swap, I can infer the definiteness off the diagonal of the reduced form. And in fact, if I need a row swap, I actually know that I'm indefinite. So by row reducing, I can always figure out the definiteness. Well, there's only one step here. I have a pivot in the 1, 1 position that's negative 1. I can eliminate this 2 with the row operation row 2 plus 2 row 1 goes to row 2. So that eliminates the 2 now. And I'm left with an upper triangular matrix. That's a row echelon form of my original 2 by 2 Hessian. And the diagonal entries here are negative 1 and negative 8. They're both negative, which tells me that my Hessian was a uh, negative definite uh, matrix. So this is a negative definite matrix, which means I'm thinking of this function as concave down, which means I can expect my linear approximation to be an overestimate. So um, uh, th this sort of gives us a motivation for calculating the definiteness of something. The Hessian derivative is a, uh, an n by n real symmetric matrix, and knowing the definiteness of that matrix can tell me whether or not my um, linear approximations are overshooting or undershooting the actual values. And again, uh, one of the cool things about this calculation is I don't need to do a messy eigenvalue calculation. I only need one row reduction to figure out the definiteness.